Carnegie Hall in New York City, the home of the world's greatest musical events. Today's event is one in a series of New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein. And here is Mr. Bernstein. to everybody. I'm awfully glad to see you all back again. And I want to thank you all particularly for your wonderful letters and telegrams about our last show, which made us all feel very happy and proud. Now this time we're going to be talking about what makes American music sound American. And just to start things off, here's a little American music.
Now, I don't think there's anybody in this hall or anywhere in the country watching this program, or for that matter, anyone anywhere in the civilized world who wouldn't know right away that that music we just played is American music. It's got America written all over it, not just in the title, which, as you know, is an American in Paris, and not just because the composer Gershwin was American, but it's in the music itself. It sounds American. It smells American. It, it makes you feel American when you hear it. Now, why is that? What makes certain music seem to belong to America and seem to belong to us? Now, that's what we're going to try and find out today. Almost every country or nation has some kind of music that belongs to it and sounds right and natural for its people. Uh, when a nation has its own kind of music, we call that music nationalistic. Sometimes it's just folk music, very simple songs, or sometimes not even songs, maybe just prayers for rain banged out on Congo drums, or a sort of primitive chanting in an Arab style. Or it could be uh, dance music, like a mazurka from Poland. Mm. Or it could be a tarantella from Italy. This is a piece I learned when I was 11. I still can't play it very well. <laughs> there. Or it might be a reel from Ireland. But the minute you hear that reel, you know it's Irish. Just the way you knew that mazurka was Polish or the tarantella was Italian. Now, you tell me what country this music makes you think of. What country is that? Right! Right! My goodness, you're, as you would say, hep. Now, it's Spanish. You couldn't mistake that rhythm in a million years. Yump, tick a da pa 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 Or you couldn't mistake those castanets. Or the tambourines. That's Spanish. Now, what country does this music make you think of? Some of you said gypsy, some said Hungary. It's the same idea. It's Hungarian as goulash. Can't mistake that. Now, what about this? Right, right. My, you're all so smart today. That's Russian. You can't miss it. It's got to be Russian because it has a Russian folk song in it. It has a tune that all Russians know and have sung since they were little kids. That tune, by the way, is called The Little Birch Tree. And in Russian, I, I don't sing Russian very well, but it goes something like this. I think that's the word, soyala. Loli, loli, soyala. Loli, loli, soyala. Well, Tchaikovsky used that tune in that symphony we just played, and that settles that symphony. It's Russian. So you can understand that when this kind of music is played in the country it belongs to, all the people listening to it 
feel that it belongs to them, that they belong to it. It's their music. Because in most countries, the people who live there are descended for hundreds and hundreds of years from their forefathers and their forefathers' forefathers who all sang the same little tunes and sort of owned them. So when the Russians hear a Tchaikovsky symphony, they feel closer to it than, say, a Frenchman does or than we do. Now, what about us here in America? What's our folk music? What did our forefathers sing? That's the problem, because we all have different kinds of forefathers. For example, Mr. Corigliano there has Italian forefathers, and Varga has hung, Varga's forefathers were, what were they, Hungarian, and mine were Jewish, and Mr. McGuinness's were Scotch-Irish, and Mr. Wummer's were Dutch, I believe, Dutch. And what about your forefathers? What about yours? What were your forefathers? Can you tell? What about yours? Hungarian, somebody just said. What were yours? Polish. What were yours? Well, you see, we could be here all day listing all the forefathers that you had. We could be here for ages. Sweden, Spain, Hungary, England, Germany. They come from everywhere. But we haven't got ours to be here and list them all. So you see, that is our problem. The problem is that with all those different forefathers we have, what is it that we all have in common that we could call our folk music? The folk music we've inherited. Now that's a tough question. Because you see, we haven't had a very long time to develop a folk music. Don't forget America is a very new country compared to all those European ones. We're not even 200 years old yet. And that's not very old for countries. We're still a baby, a big, strong, fine baby, but still a baby. And so our music is also still very young. Uh, actually, our real serious American music didn't even begin till about 75 years ago. And at that time, the few American composers we did have were imitating the European composers, like Brahms and Liszt and Wagner and all those. We might call that the kindergarten period of American music. Our composers then were like happy, innocent little kids in kindergarten. For instance, uh, we had a very fine composer named George W. Chadwick. And he wrote very expert music and also deeply felt music. But you can almost not tell it apart from the music of Brahms and Wagner and other Europeans, like this overture of his. Listen. beginning of our 20th century, American composers were beginning to feel funny about not writing American sounding music. And it took a foreigner to point this out to them. A Czechoslovakian composer named Dvorak, who came here on a visit and was amazed to find all the American composers writing the same kind of music he wrote. So he said to the American composers, look, why don't you use your folk stuff in your own music when you write? You've got marvelous stuff here. Indian music, which is the, the, which who are, the Indians are the real native Americans, he said. After all, they were here before you were, so use their music. But he was forgetting the important thing, that Indian music has nothing to do with most of us. Our forefathers were not Indians. 
And so their music is not our music. We didn't grow up ourselves banging on primitive drums and yelling war hoops. But Dvorak didn't worry about all that. He got excited, so excited, that he decided he was going to write an American symphony himself and show us all how it could be done. So he made up some Indian themes and some Negro themes, because he also decided Negro folk music was part of American history. And he wrote a whole new world symphony around those themes. The trouble is that the symphony doesn't sound very American. It sounds Czech, really, which is what it should sound. And very pretty it is, too. This is doesn't sound American to me. Now, I'm sure you all know the second movement of this symphony. It's the most famous part of the symphony. It's a tune that everybody knows, usually by the name of Going Home. Most people think it's a Negro spiritual, and it's often sung that way. But it isn't a Negro spiritual at all. A nice Czech melody by Uncle Dvorak. And there's nothing Negro or American about it. In fact, if I put words to it about Czechoslovakia, it could uh, easily sound like the Czech national anthem. Suppose a guy sang, Czechoslovakia, how I long for thee. It's perfectly Czech. There's nothing American about it at all. But in spite of this, Dvorak made a big impression on the American composers of his time, and they all got excited, too, and began to write hundreds of so-called American pieces with Indian and Negro melodies in them. It became a disease, almost an epidemic. Everybody was doing it. And most of these Montezuma operas and mini ha, -ha symphonies and cotton-picking suites are all dead and forgotten and gathering dust in second-hand bookstores. Why? Because you can't just decide to be American. You can't just sit down and say, I'm going to write American music if it kills me. You can't be nationalistic on purpose. That was the mistake. But it was a natural mistake for our composers to be making at the beginning. Those early men were just learning to be American. They were just graduating from that kindergarten we talked about into grammar school. But even out of this grammar school period came some pretty fine music. A lot of it by Edward McDowell. McDowell wrote a suite, among other things, that uses Indian folk stuff in it. And I still can't say it sounds very American to me. He thought it sounded American, but it's more to me like our old friend Dvorak again. Just listen.
symphony, isn't it? Then there was a composer called Henry F. Gilbert, who was also very talented, but who was more interested in Negro themes than Indian ones. Here's part of a piece he wrote using tunes and rhythms of Negroes in New Orleans, especially a Creole dance called the Bambula. see McDowell and Gilbert and all those people wrote very fine music indeed but it's hard for us Americans to feel that it's our music the way a Russian feels about a Tchaikovsky symphony in fact those Indian and Negro themes even sound a little strange and exotic to us if we tell the truth so we still didn't have a real American music not yet but now our American composers were about to graduate from grammar school and enter high school. By this time, the First World War was already over, and something new and very special had come into American music. Can you guess what it is? What was it? Right. Jazz had been born, and that changed everything, because at last there was something like an American folk music that belonged to all Americans. Jazz was everybody's music. Everybody could dance the foxtrot back in the 20s. Everybody knew how to sing Alexander's Ragtime Band, whether he came from North Dakota or West Virginia or South Carolina. So any serious composer growing up in this time couldn't keep jazz out of his ears or out of his music. It was part of him. It was in the air he breathed. A composer like Aaron Copland began to write pieces such as music for the theater, which is filled with jazz ideas, like this.
being played by the Boston Symphony Orchestra 30 odd years ago, as it was. What a shock those Bostonians must have had hearing Copeland's jazz in Symphony Hall. But you, certainly the composer who used jazz most and most consistently was Gershwin. When he wrote his Rhapsody in Blue in 1924, he really rocked this town of New York and then the whole country and then finally the whole civilized world. Now imagine how this must have sounded to the ears of those serious concert goers back then. like an American folk music that everybody understood, a real natural folk influence, jazz, much realer and more natural than any Indian love calls or Negro spirituals could ever be. But our composers were still in high school and were still being American on purpose, only instead of Indian and Negro stuff, now they began to use jazz to be American, to, to be able to say, look, I'm writing American music. That wasn't very natural. But by the time they got to the 30s, in the 30s, the jazz influence became a part of their living and breathing. It became a habit. And the composers didn't even have to think twice about using jazz. They just wrote music and it came out American all by itself. That was much better. That was leaving high school and going to college. Now, let's see how this change worked. For instance, take the rhythms of jazz. Now, the thing that makes jazz rhythm so special is something called syncopation, which means getting an accent where you don't expect one, getting a strong beat where you expect a weak beat. Now let's try and see if we can do a syncopation together. We're all going to clap together, regular even beats. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, five. But without getting faster, without getting slower, just keeping it steady. And while we do that, the drummers up there are going to suck their drums in a syncopated Charleston rhythm with accents in the wrong places, in between our beats, which are the right places. Okay, well, let's see how you're going to do it. That's fine. All right, you ready? Here goes. Even and steady. Five. Very good. No, 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 no. We mustn't let them mix us up. You see, we mustn't let their syncopated beats throw us off. We've got to keep steady no matter what they do, so they have something to syncopate against. You understand? Now let's try it again. Steady, steady, steady. Oh, that's much better. Much, much better. Now, did you hear all that syncopated stuff going on up there? Da, 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 which we used to call the Charleston back in the 20s. Now, let's turn this whole thing around and let them do the dull, regular, steady beat. Boom, 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 boom. While we do the Charleston. Let's see how we're going to do it. Da, 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 da. That's pretty good. Okay, ready? Go. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let them start. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful. I can see you really feel those jazzy accents. And why shouldn't you? You're all Americans. You should feel it. 
Now, back in those days that we called the high school days, composers would use these syncopated beats just like jazz, as we heard before in the Copeland piece and the Gershwin piece. But after a while, in the 30s, those syncopations became a part of the music, so much so that the music doesn't even sound like jazz anymore. In other words, it was no longer using syncopation on purpose to be American, but using it by accident, just by habit. So that now we've got a brand new rhythm, which is an American rhythm, coming out of jazz, but which doesn't sound like jazz at all. By now it's become a natural part of our daily musical speech. For instance, a composer called Roger Sessions writes a piece for organ, a chorale prelude. Now, never mind what a chorale prelude is, but anyway, just know that it's a serious organ piece with a sort of religious atmosphere about it. Now, that's the last place in the world where you'd expect to hear jazzy, syncopated accents. But there they are, deep in the music, making it all sound very American, but without sounding anything like jazz, as you'll hear. Just listen. It's full of jazz accents, or accents that come out of jazz, and that just couldn't be music by a European. It's sort of like the English language spoken with an American accent. It's the accent that makes it different, it makes it almost like a whole other language. The accent, the rhythm of speaking, the speed that comes out of the way we live and the way we move in America. Just think what a difference there is between the English language spoken by a British poet like Keats and uh, the English language by an American poet. It's really the same language, after all. The words look the same on paper, but boy, do they sound different. Uh, just listen to this bit of Keats. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, and so on. And now compare that English with this by an American poet named Kenneth Fearing. And while he died as while he lived, going whop to the office and bluey home to sleep, and Biff got married and Bam had children, and Oof got fired, and Zowie did he live, and Zowie did he die. Well, it's almost like two different languages, isn't it? Well, something like that happened in American music. The jazz influence grew to be such a deep part of our musical language that it changed the whole sound of our music. Take a simple horn call, for example. Music has always, always been full of horn calls and trumpet calls and bugle calls. Uh, here's the way Beethoven used a horn call in his third symphony, a fine, old, European, dignified way. And here's the way an American composer called Morton Gould uses the same notes, only they come out a little more like a Louis Armstrong horn call. See what I mean? Now, I don't want to give you the idea that jazz is the whole story, not by a long shot. There are many other things about American music that make it sound American besides jazz. Things that have nothing to do with jazz, but have to do with different sides of the American personality. Now, one of the main personality traits that we have in our music is the one of youth. It's young music. It's loud, strong, wildly optimistic. William Schumann is a composer who's a perfect example of this quality. His American Festival Overture, for example, is full of rip-roaring vitality, and it reminds you of kids having a marvelous time in the park. In fact, this overture was based on a street call that Schumann used when he was a kid. The fellows used to call each other to come out and play. It was a call that went, we are key. I don't know if any of you still use that now, but in Schumann's time, he did anyhow. And he based this overture on it. Listen to how he uses it.
vitality, hasn't it? There's nothing, nothing depressed or gloomy about old Bill Schumann. Uh, then there's another kind of American vitality, which is not so much of the city, but belongs more to the rugged West, it's full of pioneer energy. The music of Roy Harris has lots of this quality. Listen to this little bit from his third symphony. Somehow that ruggedness is purely American in its feeling. Then there's a kind of loneliness in American music that's different from other kinds of loneliness. You find it in the way the notes are spaced very far apart from one another, like the great wide open spaces that our big country is so full of. Take this part of Copeland's ballet, Billy the Kid, for instance. Uh, this section describes a quiet night scene on the prairie. wide-open feeling, that's very American, too. Then there's a kind of sweet, simple, sentimental quality that gets into our music. I think it comes from hymn singing, especially from Southern Baptist hymn singing. We can find lots of this kind of very American, naive, plain quality in the music of Virgil Thompson, for instance, who comes from Kansas City. Here's a bit from one of his operas called the mother of us all, and listen for that sweet, homespun American simplicity. We have another kind of sentimentality in our music that comes out of our popular songs, the sort of crooning pleasure, like taking a long, delicious, warm bath. Here's a part of Randall Thompson's second symphony. Don't mix him up with Virgil Thompson, which is almost like a song Perry Como sings.
And in fact, there are so many different qualities in our American music that it would take much too long to list them all. There are as many sides to American music as there are to the American people, our great, varied, many-sided democracy. And perhaps that's the main quality of all, our many-sidedness. Think of all the races and personalities from all over the globe that make up our country. When we think of that, we can understand why our own folk music is so complicated. We've taken it all in, French, Dutch, German, Scotch, Scandinavian, Italian, and all the rest, and learned it from one another, borrowed it, stolen it, cooked it all up in a melting pot. So what our composers are finally nourished on is a folk music that is probably the richest in the world. And all of it is American in spirit, whether it's jazz or square dance tunes <coughs> or cowboy songs or hillbilly music or rock and roll or Cuban mambos or Mexican wapangos or Missouri hymn singing. It's like all those different accents we have in our speech. There's a little Mexican accent in the Texas accent, and there's a little Swedish to be heard in the Minnesota accent, and there's a little Slavic to be heard in Brooklyn, and there's a little Irish in the Boston accent, but they're all American accents. They've been absorbed. And now, as a final example of all this, I want you to hear part of the, of the Third Symphony by Aaron Copland, which has a lot of these American qualities we've been talking about. Jazz rhythms, and wide open optimism, and wide open spaces, and the simplicity, and the sentimentality, and a mixture of things from all over the world, a noble fanfare, a hymn, everything. But I have a special surprise for you. We've been lucky enough to get Mr. Copeland himself in person to come and conduct it for us. And now, you're going to meet a real American composer who has been through this whole development we've been talking about, grammar school, high school, college, even graduate school, and we could say that by now he has become the dean of all American music. I am proud to turn this podium over to Aaron Copeland.